The war in Europe and America had left England with a huge national debt, and it was felt that the colonies should pay their fair share. King George III and his ministers devised a new system of taxation for the colonies, not only to pay for the war, but to make the colonies once more enrich the mother country. The war, however, had done much to develop the strength and resistance of the colonies, who had come to realize that their only real security and independence was in their unity and joint cooperation. In addition, the valuable military experience gained from the French and Indian War prepared the colonists for war and produced such leaders as George Washington. The war also prepared the colonists for the revolution by revealing to them their own fighting ability and by showing that the British regulars were not invincible. It was, therefore, a logical result of the history of the colonies that they would resist control from afar and seek to develop their own independent resources. Most Englishmen at that time, however, did not see this. George III was in full control, and his meddling in state affairs, his impractical and fickle plans, and the short-sightedness of his supporters were in large measure responsible for the events that ensued. From 1760 on, England tried to enforce the Navigation Acts, which were based on the concept that a colony was to be managed to benefit the mother country. One aspect of these laws was the writ of assistance, which empowered an officer to enter a home at any time to search for smuggled goods. A young Boston lawyer, James Otis, Jr., resigned his position in the colonial government and described the writs of assistance as instruments of slavery. Then and there, commented John Adams, the trumpet of the revolution was sounded. In May 1764, a report reached Boston that a stamp act for the colonies had been proposed in Parliament to raise money by taxing public papers and deeds. A feeling of rage swept through the colonies, who had never before been taxed by anyone but their own legislatures. In the event of a violation of the law, a colonist would be tried without a jury before a judge whose only pay came from the fines he imposed. The uproar was heard throughout the colonies and resulted in the burning of the stamps and the resignation, in terror, of every stamp distributor in the land. By February 1765, the Stamp Act was withdrawn, but replaced with other laws and actions against the colonies. In 1767, a duty was placed on glass, paper, and tea. In 1768, the Billeting Act was passed in Parliament, which required the colonists to feed the British troops quartered among them. On March 5, 1770, a squad of British soldiers fired on a mob of men and boys in Boston, and three persons were killed, including a black man named Crispus Attucks. On the evening of December 16, 1773, the Boston Tea Party brought to a head the trouble that had been building between the king and the colonists. The port of Boston was closed, and the firm hand of the king set down on all the colonies. To decide what to do, each colony sent a representative to Philadelphia, and the First Continental Congress convened. The colonists felt that they had been abused long enough, and it was time to take action.